For those who don't know me, my name is Harry Bolton and I'll be your MC for today. I'd now like to call to the state, to the podium Mr Peter Jeffrey, our Chair of the School of, uh, Friends of the School of Arts Committee, uh, to welcome you here today. Please welcome Peter. Thank you, Harry. You've, you've taken some of the words out of my mouth. I was going to say how wonderful it is to be back in this room with, with an activity going on. So, so it's my, my duty to welcome you here today, and I'd particularly like to welcome Andrew, Andrew, Adrian Pickley. He's, he's travelled a long way to come here from Griffith, and uh, I think that's a, that's a great tribute to, to his effort for education in the past and in the future. I'd, I'd like to welcome the high, next year's high school captains. Um, Brian Ian Jackson, thank you for coming and you, you will be uh, having some remarks shortly. I'd like to uh, also welcome the Toms and other members of the, of the Parks family who uh, attend regularly to these events in Tenterfield and uh, really makes a, a personal thing of the whole, the whole thing. The, uh, the uh, talk today, Valuing Regional Education, it actually fits very well with the School of Arts. The School of Arts and Mechanics Institute were the adult education things of, of the uh, 19th century and probably 20th century and they performed a very uh, important role in education of the community. No doubt, no doubt the talk today will be mainly about uh, um, school education and, uh, and university education, etc. But there are many parts to education and, and uh, we keep being told we should always keep learning. So, I'm very pleased to see the, the, the people here today. It's, uh, it's wonderful and we just hope the uh, success of this and uh, perhaps a change of management in the building that may continue into the future. <laughs> thank, you, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, Peter. It's now my duty to welcome to, this, to the, this thing, the lectern, our future school captains. It's uh, become a bit of a tr tradition uh, for the Parks Oration to have our school captains come and uh, present uh, at, this, uh, at this occasion. And uh, over the years, it's always been a, uh, an exciting part of the day. So uh, without further ado, please welcome our school captains of 2024, Bridie McKay and Jackson Clark. Mr Chairman, Professor the Honourable Adrian Pickley, members of the Parks family, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon everyone. Jackson and I are extremely honoured and thankful for the opportunity to stand here today on behalf of our school, Tenerfield High School. Not only is it enchanting to represent an, an event which we celebrate the 2023 Sir Henry Parks Oration, this is an everlasting event and that has valued especially in our town Tenerfield, where the man himself created history. As our current year 12 students, Jackson and I granted the experience today to hear words from Professor Adrian Piccolo in hope to enhance our knowledge on regional education and Henry's effect. Sir Henry Parks, who was born the 27th of May in Warwickshire, New England, 1815. Parks's formal education, in his own words, was very limited and imperfect. As a boy, he had to help support his family. As such, he worked as a road labourer and a brick pit, and later as an apprentice for John Holding, a bone and inventory turner. Matter of fact, some of Parks' work can be seen in a museum display, particularly a walking stick which depicts a hand grasping as a snake. Parks and his wife travelled to Australia aboard the Strathfield Say and reached Sydney on the 25th of July 1839. Upon arrival, he found work as a labourer and later the customs department. 
In the 1840s, New South Wales was growing out of its convict colony status and Parkes believed it was time for the colony to start making their own rules, building a new society without the arrival of more ships and convicts. Despite the lack of formal education, Parkes' skills as a writer developed tremendously and in 1842 he published his first book of verse, Stolen Moments. Parkes then joined the Anti-Transportation League, which, the, which opposed convicts coming to New South Wales, meanwhile becoming the editor of the Empire, a newspaper which quickly became the voice of freedom and democracy in the colony. Parkes was a strong advocate of the idea to make Australia a federation, as by this time, Australia was still considered a British colony. As such, there was no Australian army. Rather, six separate militias for six different colonies. Because of the lack of an organised military, Australia was heavily reliant on the British Navy to send ships to Australia and sail around the continent. Parks hated this idea. If Australia were to become a federation, that would mean the six different militias would unify and create one united army, the Australian Army. Another benefit to making Australia a federation would be easier trade and travel across the state borders. Parks was frustrated with how needlessly difficult it was to travel between the states just the different states having different writs for whale ray gouges, as well as charging a fee to allow travel between states. Parks wanted to propose these ideas in the upcoming 1882 election. However, during this time, he lost his East Sydney seat and was at risk of being forced out of Parliament. In order to keep Parks in Parliament, the chairman for Tenerfield at the time, John Dillon, gave his seat to Parks. The next day, he was allowed to run in the Tenerfield seat and therefore he was returned to Parliament. Because of this, Parks became rather fond of Tenerfield. Although the unfederated nature of the colonies was a particular concern, Tenerfield's position close to the Queensland border meant that much of its trade was inhibited by high tariffs. Discussions around colonial defence also affected Tenerfield because it was rural towns that contributed men and equipment to the state militias. On the 15th of June, 1889, Parks had a long conversation with the New South Wales Governor, Lord Carrington, who was also an advocate of federation. During this discussion, Parks boasted he could federate the colonies in 12 months, and Carrington, pandering to the politician's well-known vanity, dared to do so. <laughs> Parks decided to put all of his efforts into the movement. On the 15th of October, 1889, he suggested a conference to discuss a new constitution, and soon after travelled to Brisbane to consider the situation with his Queensland colleagues. On his way back to Sydney, Parks stopped at Tenerfield, and performed the first hearing of his speech and dominantly argued that federation would enable the military in each colony to unite as a single national army under the command of a single national government. He also argued that it would enable Australia's railway gouges to be of a uniform width. The most aspiring effect of Parks' speech was how it was seen as the first direct appeal to the public rather than to a political audience of federations made by a political figure, proving his devotion and willingness to not only Australia, but its citizens, an eternal example of the power of voice. The speech was reported in the Sydney newspapers. Lord Carrington telegraphed Parks to return to Sydney immediately and deliver the same speech as soon as possible. He went on to present the same speech 15 times in different locations over the next nine months. Parks served five terms as New South Wales Premier from 1872 and 1891. Not only is this the most term served by any Premier, but if added together, Parks is the longest serving New South Wales Premier. The Australian colonies had developed separately for the first hundred years of their existence, but by the 1880s, a move towards the economic and social integration had started. After Parks had delivered his speeches across Australia, the fate of Australia's future was now left in the hands of Australia's populace. By and large, six colonies were undecided. Some loved the idea, others hated it. Victoria and Queensland were the first were the first to join the Federation. After extreme hesitancy, New South Wales was the next state to join. One media company published a newspaper mocking New South Wales for their hesitancy to join the Federation. An illustration in the newspaper depicts a man trying to pull an elephant across the Federation Bridge, which represents Victoria trying to convince New South Wales to join the Federation. Eventually, New South agreed to join. Some, some states still had suspicion about the Federation. Some people just thought that Henry Parks was arrogant and that he spoke too much. Newspapers and articles took these concepts and illustrated. Henry on his high horse and the jaw of Federation, however, South Australia and Tasmania did eventually join the Federation. Western Australia did not. On any part of the Federation, they simply wanted to remain disconnected from the rest of the continent and remain their own 
colonial nation. The states that joined early, such as Queensland and Victoria, believed that the six states would be stronger together and unified to create one strong nation. However, Victoria was also frightened of the outcome if Australia did not become a federation. They believed that there would be wars fought on every border and that the most dominant state would claim the whole continent. Despite the indecisiveness, Australia unanimously agreed on federating Australia. And so on the 1st of January 1901, Australia became a federated nation. Parks contributed accomplishments and impact to Australia is one that had such an outcome and we proudly live in its results today. Parks once quoted, a man must be himself or nothing, which can be seen as a sum up of Parks' way of life. He spoke his heart, spoke for all and listened to the voices of Australia. A figure that we can admire, thank and follow for generations to come. In the 1870s, during his time as Premier, Sir Henry Parks was appalled to see the condition of a Sydney infirmary. It baffled him as to how you could put sick and injured people in a disgusting room with rats and insects scuttling across an unclean floor with unqualified nurses tending to the patients. To see about improving the state of Australian hospitals, Parks contacted Florence Nightingale to help redesign the hospitals to make them healthier for the sick and injured. Nightingale undertook extensive research into the design of the hospitals. During her time in the Crimean War, she found that soldiers were not dying from their injuries in battle, but instead the illnesses they contracted from the hospital. Her theory was that natural sunlight and fresh air helped with the healing process. She also designed white walls and long corridors leading to single rooms for the patients to sleep on and that the beds were elevated to avoid the filth from the floor. During the late 1800s, Sir Henry Parks travelled to London to meet Florence Nightingale and approved the design that she had made. Upon Parks' return trip to Australia, Nightingale sent four of her most highly qualified nurses with him, as well as a maiden, to train the nurses in Australia much to the dismay of the doctors in Australia, who previously were in charge of the nation's hospital system. Parks and Nightingale's hospital design would, be go, on, would go on to be used worldwide and pave the way for the structural and hygienic standards within hospitals. However, this, is, this design was not truly recognised until the 1910s to the 1920s, with the construction of the isolation ward here in Tenerfield after the outbreak of the Spanish flu. Sir Henry Parks passed away on the 27th of May 1896 and did not live to see Australia become a federation, merely five years later. Although he did not see his life's work, it was an idea and contribution to a federated nation that brings us all here today. It was Parks' idea to unite Australia and in turn become the face of federation. Parks is also partially responsible for the modern day hospital, healthcare system and education across the world. But it was his powerful speech in October 1889 when he stopped here in Tenerfield on his return trip from Brisbane, despite theories if he was meant to be here or not, and spoke right in his very room 134 years ago. How lucky are we to be standing in the very venue everlasting where history was made. Thank you. Right in Jackson, thank you very much. If I didn't know better, I'd think that you've been to some of my uh, education lessons here in Tenerfield. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent talk. This uh, time of year, every two years, is a wonderful time in Tenerfield because it brings the Tom back to our community. <laughs> and uh, Ian and Val come and spend a couple of days here. They arrived normally the day before this uh, this, this day and uh, stay and then uh, return home the day after. So again it is wonderful to invite to, to have the Toms here again and welcome you both for being here. And I'd now like to uh, ask uh, Ian if he would come forward and introduce our speaker for today's oration. Thank you Ian. Well, thank Harry, and a particular thanks to Bridie and Jackson. They've been in the job. They found out two weeks ago they're going to be asked to do this, and you've compiled a fantastic summary of, you know, such a lifetime to be captured in a few minutes. So you've done a brilliant job, and congratulations on, on that. And uh, I want to thank the friends of the School of Arts. It's been a battle. And we wouldn't be here without Peter, Christine and, and Harry's uh, 
behind the scenes working and uh, that is certainly very much appreciated. And I welcome those of you who are looking uh, at us on the screen at home on the live streaming. I give apologies for two of our advisors who are regular attenders. Uh, Ken Halliday has been a past president of the uh, Friends of the School of Arts, a Tenterfield resident journalist, um, and now living at, down at Coffs, so that's a bit far for Ken at this stage, and we, he and uh, his wife would have been with us otherwise, I think. And also uh, Peter Weber. Now Peter's uh, my co-chair at the Henry Parks Foundation, and uh, he, he assists with so many things. Peter's career was an architect, and Peter was also a very strong member of the National Trust and to the state that he was on the board of the National Trust. And Peter is a signatory to the 50-year lease representing the National Trust with the lease to the council for this premises. And uh, Peter gives his apologies, and as does his wife Helen. And Helen is a great granddaughter of Sir Henry, so there's a nice link there. We have other advisors here today. Cathy Gray, who has been responsible for all our, all our PR and, uh, and leaflets here. Thank you, Cathy. Uh, Di Barnes, who will be doing the Q&A later. And, and uh, Julian Weber, another great, great granddaughter, who's come up from um, Goulburn. Other past descendants, we have Liddy Brown and, and Murray Weber. I think that's all of the, the tribe that are here with us. That's, that's all good. So a little bit about the Henry Parks Foundation. We're a charitable trust. We started in December 1988. We signed our trust deed on, on Governor, uh, uh, Henry's desk in the Governor's office uh, at that stage. Uh, Gordon Samuels was our, our thing. And we've got a board of advisors, some of who have been mentioned. Now the foundation aims to encourage Australians to find out more about their country, political and constitutional history, and about how they can participate as citizens. And we hold these annual orations with distinguished speakers focusing on challenging and social pol and political issues in the Australian society, with some reference to the ideals of Henry Park. We've tried to cover uh, like the nursing that was mentioned, we've covered the railways, we've covered the constitution and a whole range of different subjects that Henry had been involved with and we try to link our, ourselves around those sort of things. Now that, continuing on with that line of distinguished figures, today we have Professor Adrian Pickley uh, to address us about valuing regional education and economic as well as a social imperative. It's got wide repercussions. We asked Adrian to be our orator in 2021, but he was going to go to New Zealand, and then of course COVID came, and none of us had anything. We tried to do it by Zoom a couple of years ago as well. Uh, and how Adrian's kindly accepted our invitation to the second invitation. So thank you. Now, when Henry Parks retired from politics, he was asked what he believed were his greatest achievements. He'd been five times Premier of New South Wales, and he claimed that his Education Act, his Public Schools Act of 1866, and his Public Instruction Act of 1880 were the ones he was most proud of. Of course, as mentioned, that was before all his achievements towards Federation, which started here, this place, uh, in, in Tenterfield was achieved. So he had a long way to go to get to Federation. And like Henry, Adrian has given service to the people and the Parliament of New South Wales. He served 17 and a half years uh, as, uh, from 1999 to 2017, representing the areas of Murray and Murrumbidgee, great regional areas. But in this time, that included six years as the Education Minister and under two Premiers. So that's another bit of juggling. And I, I feel this makes him really qualified to address us today. And post-retirement uh, from Parliament, Adrian hasn't just put his feet up. He's been, uh, became a founding director of the Gonski Institute for Education at the University of New South Wales. And he's now leading the education practice at that global um, consulting firm, Corn Ferry. Even still more, to keep himself busy, 
He's published a book in 2019, 12 Ways Your Child Can Get the Best Out of School. And I don't think that means not turning up. I think they've got to go. <laughs> uh, and so together with our 2007 Henry Parks uh, Tenderfell Orifer, Jeff Gallup, the former Premier of WA, and author and educator, Parsi Salzberg, Adrian has been busy working to promote and improve the current education system. We appreciate that you've come here today uh, to be able to tell us about valuing regional education and economic as well as the social imperative. Adrian, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ian, for that very kind uh, introduction. If I can start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on here today, I pay my respects to present, uh, past and emerging uh, Aboriginal people and uh, others who are here present uh, with us today. Um, this is the first time I've ever stopped in Tenterfield. So having lived for 53 years in Griffith, um, when I was a teenager, we used to come, used to go to the Gold Coast. So we'd come through Tenterfield many times as a, as a teenager. And, uh, you know, as a teenager, you know, historic buildings and country towns weren't of that much interest. But um, coming here yesterday uh, and spending uh, particularly the morning here, um, and having lived all my life in the opposite corner of, of New South Wales, uh, admittedly, but living in a country town, um, it's a fascinating place. It's a beautiful place, it's got great shops, it's got great cafes, it's got a great feel about the place. And as a typical country town, I walked from the hotel, the Jumbuck, up the other up the other end of the main street, back down again, and I heard at least six times from six different people uh, about what was happening. That this this place had been pr proposed to be closed. And there's a new general manager that they've closed the tourist information centre, and that. <laughs> I mean, that's the great thing about uh, country towns. It's actually the hospitality and the familiarity uh, that people have. And I mean, I'm a complete stranger, and. Um, I mean, not everybody who told me that were complete strangers, but some of them were, but just wanted to tell me what was, uh, what was happening and what was sort of the local news. So it doesn't take you long in a country town to find out uh, exactly, um, exactly what's going on. Um, Ian, thank you very much, uh, and, to the, and to the Sir Henry Parks Foundation for inviting me here today to present uh, the oration for 2023. Uh, and I'm very proud to have followed uh, in, the, in the footsteps of one of the most significant uh, Australians in our, in our history. We know the commitment that Sir Henry had for education and in particular the right of every Australian, wherever they live or, or whatever background uh, they have, to have access to the highest quality education. Uh, what is often these days referred to as sort of groundbreaking aspiration, and that aspiration for educational outcomes in Australia were being championed more than 100 years ago by Sir Henry. So we all stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, Ian uh, introduced me. That's, uh, that's um, um, the captain's accidentally pressed a button while they were standing up here. That's, that, that's fine. Uh, that, that's, just a, that's just a little spiel about me. Uh, I, I, I always put a picture of my kid. They're my kids. I'm probably not allowed to put pictures of other people's kids. <laughs> That's a picture of the chickens. I had the pleasure last year, uh, the opportunity, as much as the pleasure, to spend a year living in Italy. So my, my parents are Italian, my wife's parents are Italian, but we're both born here. And um, we went and lived there for a year and took our, took our two boys. They went to school. They went to school. We went for lunch uh, on, on most days. It was much harder for them because they had to go to a foreign school. <laughs> Meanwhile, we, as I said, we'd drop them off and literally we'd go looking around and go for lunch, but um, I always put a picture of my kids because it just reminds me, as, uh, particularly as an as a educationist and as a former one, I mean, what's the point of, you know, it's often discussions about education get theoretical or they get, you know, you talk about statistics, you talk about, certainly as a minister, you talk about hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars, and it constantly reminds me what it actually means, which is students like the captains here today Students like my kids, students like the hundreds of thousands of others, other, other kids who will go to school um, every single day. So that's the why we're here. Um, the other thing I need to do is acknowledge uh, my good friend, Professor Richard Holden, uh, from the University of New South Wales School of Economics. 
Uh, in the three years I spent uh, as the inaugural director of the Golsky Institute, so it was a research institute, it was an education research institute, I did a lot of work with uh, Professor Holden and the economists uh, at the University of New South Wales. So much that, so much of what happens in education, surprisingly, is better explained by economics than is explained by education academics. For example, why, why even the decisions you make when you finish year 12 next year are actually going to be economic decisions about whether you stay here, whether you go and do further study, whether it's higher education or vet or whatever else. They're actually um, behavioural economics uh, kinds of questions. And then when you look at some of the issues that are facing schools, for example, finding staff, why a particular teacher would come and teach in Tenterfield and not teach in Newcastle or teach in Sydney is actually a behavioural economics question. Because you're making decisions about income, lifestyle, partner, family, geography, even what you personally like, you love surfing, um, maybe you know, that, that'll influence your decisions. So they're actual beha behavioural economics questions. And of course, where a teacher chooses to teach has obviously a significant uh, impact on the outcome for students. Um, and as I'll discuss a little bit later, the outcomes for students are highly correlated to not just their social circumstances, but also their economic circumstances, uh, what, what is often called their socio-economic uh, circumstances. And it could be argued that the best way to improve student outcomes for, uh, for students is to improve the, the economy in which they live, uh, both their personal and their and their family and community economy, uh, as much as it is to provide them um, any different education within their school. Lifting a student's SES, or their socioeconomic uh, circumstances, and the community that they live in, actually significantly contributes to the lift in student performance. Then there's the economic perform Then there is the economic cost of the performance gap, uh, and that gap between the performance of rural and remote students compared to metropolitan students in Australia. While I was the director at the Gonski Institute, I commissioned uh, Professor uh, Holden and uh, one of his coll colleagues to calculate what that cost was. So when we talk about um, valuing education, I don't mean valuing it as in it's important, but actually putting a value on it. Putting a value on what that performance gap costs the Australian economy and what it costs uh, our regional economies. And they produced a paper called The Economic Impact of Improving Regional, Rural and Remote Education in Australia. Uh, and that's why I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to reference a few things that they talked about uh, in there. So it's really, what today is about is, what's that cost? What does it cost the economy? Um, I'm going to talk about um, the problem and how big the gap is. Uh, why is remoteness and and um, rural, regional, why is that uh, a challenge? I'll give you an example of uh, one of the challenges faced by rural schools, plus some examples of what works to close that gap and some of the things that surprisingly don't work. Uh, and what that gap obviously costs the economy and ultimately why does all this matter? So let's start with, uh, let's start with the problem. Uh, we continue in Australia uh, to have a big problem promoting access to quality education across all of Australia. We have some of the best schools in the world, in Australia, but not every school is, is one of the best schools in the world. So we are, despite what you might hear in the news about Australia's performance when the NAPLAN results come out or when the HSC results come out, we are still one of the highest uh, ranked countries in the world. Other countries are actually just improving faster than us. So generally, students in regional and remote parts of Australia, and I mean on average here, we have individual students uh, in the regions who perform fantastically, but on average, students in rural and regional parts of Australia do not benefit from the same uh, educational ex opportunities and experiences than their peers do in urban and metropolitan parts of Australia. While differences in the outcome for students are partly because of their different individual abilities, there remains a very strong disparity in educational achievements between students in country um, parts of Australia and students 
uh, who live in the city. The evidence shows us that across Australia, students um, in the regions have consistently, on average, lower levels of engagement and achievement at school than those living in metropolitan areas. Uh, and that disadvantage is a systemic problem. Uh, even back in 2011, and this whilst that's more than 10 years ago, the statistics haven't changed. I, I've, I've, I got a refresher from, uh, from uh, Richard the other day. They haven't changed, but they've in, they identified five factors that contribute to this economic disadvantage. One is, as I said, socioeconomic circumstances, and I'll, and I'll get a little bit further into that. Um, uh, indigeneity. Uh, English language proficiency, so if, if, if you have one or multiple of these, it's, it will predict to a large degree uh, educational disadvantage. So socioeconomic, indigeneity, English language proficiency, disability and remoteness. These factors uh, all contribute and in, in a complex way uh, to that uh, uh, educational disadvantage. So more specifically to rural and remote education, um, the, the findings of that report um, were that the proportion of students in very remote areas who meet sort of those minimum education milestones is between 19 and 48 per cent lower than for the Australian population as a whole. Students living outside major cities are less likely to catch up once they are off course. Regional and remote students have lower access to educational services compared to living with those in in major cities. Uh, they attend school less frequently and are less likely to enrol at university and are more likely to drop out from university. And we can understand why some of those things occur. Long way from, um, there's no university in, in, in Tenterfield. Um, you've got to travel, the cost of moving, uh, the cost of uh, paying rent uh, in a different, whether it's in the city or whether it's in Armadale or, or, or Wagga or where, wherever it might be. Uh, and the attitude of remote students towards schools on aspects such as belonging, self-confidence, purpose, motivation, perseverance, are less positive on average than those who live in metropolitan areas. Uh, and most notably, the difference between the achievements uh, increased during high school over the middle and senior school years. These, groups, these differences grow substantially when, compared, when comparing students in major cities and the most remote areas of Australia. The discrepancy is even evident in high-performing students. Um, there was a report in, in 2016 that demonstrated that even top-performing students at uh, disadvantaged schools were up to two and a half years behind top-performing students at advantaged schools. Uh, we see even in, in the regions, even high-performing students who take gap years. So I don't know if you guys are going to take gap years, but if you do, make sure you Take the gap year, have fun, make money, whatever you're going to do, but then make sure that you go back because what happens in, for regional students, even really high performing regional students, take a gap year, as a lot of students do now, but more who live in the regions uh, don't go back, don't end up going back to further study once they finish their, their gap year. So for even for high performing students, uh, it's a problem. Uh, Again, it shows that the data shows gaps between uh, rates of attendance, year 12 uh, completion, uh, and that rate uh, of student attendance declines uh, considerably the further remote um, uh, a community gets. Uh, indeed, uh, again, the statistics around the world indicate that the link between student background and educational achievement is stronger uh, in Australia than in other OECD countries uh, or with equivalent education systems. So we have a particular problem in Australia. Every year in the United States, the UK, Canada, similar countries, even countries like Finland, Finland with big urban centres but big regional, but, but lots of sort of regional and remote uh, uh, parts of the country, suffer the same problem but not to the same degree that Australia has. I, I'm not going to go through this because it's you know, detail, but you can, you know, there's lots of data about the differences uh, in performance. So you'll see, this is, this is performance in year three, five, seven, nine. That's um, major cities, inner regional, so that's Wagga, Armadale, places like that, Bathurst, um, outer regional, which would be Tenterfield and the like, and uh, the light blue there is 
remote or very remote. But you see across year three, five, year seven, and year nine, it declines the further you go out. Um, that's profession, uh, proportion of students above the national, media, national minimum standards for reading. Again, you can see the decline as you go further out. Uh, students, student attendance, obviously missing 2020 because of COVID. Um, but you see the drop post-COVID. Now they're talking about, I think you, you referenced it there, even post-COVID, um, the attendance has, has dropped. It's more difficult to get students um, back. Um, again, uh, for those at the back, it's a uh, proportion of public school students, HSC results in the top two achievement bands, uh, 2018 to 2022. So you can see a big, a big difference between metropolitan year 12 results and region, regional. But as I say, it's on average, uh, we have very high performing students who, uh, who uh, go to school in the regions. Well, I'll come, I'll come back to that in a sec. So why is remoteness uh, a problem for students? Uh, regional and remote schools find it hard to offer a broad range of curriculum opportunities for students because of lower enrolments, smaller class sizes, smaller schools, shortage of experienced teachers, particularly for specialist subjects. That's an issue for engagement in year 12. Um, some students are easier to engage than other students. They have two captains, I'm sure, are very easy to engage at school. Others, not so much. So not being able to offer the subjects that they find interesting um, because, because of class sizes, not enough students, difficulty attracting staff, again, makes engagement uh, even that more challenging in the regions. Uh, it can affect the uh, access to the internet, which is important for schools, particularly if you're going to do any kind of um, remote delivery, uh, which, which schools want to do more and more of. Uh, but it also affects the ability for students to work at home, to do homework, and affects the ability of parents to help their students uh, at home. Now, everything research used to have a bank of uh, Encyclopedia Britannica at home. Uh, I'm not sure we want to go back to that because I'm not sure you want to go looking through. Remember when you used to get the updates and you had to, you had to go through all your thing and update your Encyclopedia Britannica? But access to internet uh, is, uh, is an ongoing challenge. Um, it's a challenge to school attendance uh, and accessing secondary education through, because of long distance, can be a challenge. There's lots of primary schools scattered all over the place, fewer high schools. So anything that makes attending high school more difficult for students who are on the margins of being engaged, if it's distance, even if it's getting on a, on a, on a bus for half an hour or longer, uh, that makes attendance uh, uh, even more difficult. So what about this question about socioeconomic status? So there is a strong link between the socioeconomic status of a student and the community they live in to the performance of, uh, of that student. Um, what, does it, what does it mean and why does it matter? Uh, so students who live in, who, who are from low SES backgrounds and who live in low SES areas are less likely to make uh, progress at school. Uh, research has demonstrated a, a correlation between remoteness and educational disadvantage. That is, the more remote a student is, the more educationally disadvantaged they are and the more likely they are to be in a low, SES, in a low SES community. So what does SES mean, socioeconomic status? The most basic measure is based on the highest educational attainment of a child's parents. Mothers are very important, as we all know, for lots of reasons, but the educational attainment of a child's mother, parents particularly, but particularly a mother, are really important. Um, research demonstrates that students whose parents have low educational levels, lower le educational levels, tend to have a learning gap of 10 months by year three, which grows to two and a half years by year nine. Again, on average. Even where two students have similar ability in year three, a student with parents with lower levels of education is less likely to consistently make progress than a, similarly, a similar student whose parents have a higher level of education. Beyond just uh, the level of parental education, um, the environment of a student's home and community factors that can impact negatively upon their attendance and success at school. Some of this is around aspiration. If you live in a community where not many people have gone on to either further study, and I don't mean higher education, as uh, Peter, I think, mentioned, 
um, the, the arts and uh, vocational training, an apprenticeship, or higher education. If you don't live in a community where that's talked about or valued, um, then it's less likely that you're going to have that aspiration. Sometimes students don't know what's out there, don't know what opportunities, don't even know what courses are available, don't even know what can be done online without even leaving your home uh, or communities. So factors like poor health and inadequate nutrition have an impact on a student's um, performance at school. I mean, my kids turn up at nine o'clock in the morning at school and all they've had an argument about is that they want what they had for breakfast, uh, they want to eat rubbish, uh, we want them to eat something good. You know, other kids turn up at nine o'clock and they've been awake all night because of domestic violence or, or, or not in a safe place or in a cold home or no home at all. I mean, when you, when you go to school with those kinds of circumstances as opposed to um, kids like mine, they turn up at nine o'clock, my kids turn up at nine o'clock ready, ready for school, other kids turn up at nine o'clock and actually learning is the last thing on their minds. So SES is very important. Uh, but it is somewhat of a vicious cycle. And I'm going to show you this slide. I know it looks a bit, from up the back there, you, you, you won't be able to see what it says. And what it says doesn't really matter, actually. But I'll just tell you what it says. It, it ranks all of the New South Wales electorates by the percentage of people who, whose highest level of education is Year 12. So they've done no further than Year 12. And what this shows you is that Oh, so it shows you the ranking, right? Uh, there's 93 New South Wales electorates. Highlighted in green are regional electorates. So regional electorates have um, the, 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 the highest proportion of um, electorates where parents don't even have year 12 qualifications. So what I'm trying to say is it's the... Um, the country electorates, regional electorates, have the, the, the lowest proportion of, of parents with higher levels of education, if that makes sense. I actually printed off the wrong, um, <laughs> the wrong, uh, the wrong chart uh, because this is this is sort of showing you. But anyway, you get you get the point. So in regional electorates, we actually have parents with lower levels of education than in metropolitan electorates. So all the ones not highlighted, highlighted there on, the, on your left-hand side tend to be kind of North, North Shore, Inner West, uh, Eastern suburbs of, of Sydney. And then interestingly, I've just added in red there, Western Sydney, Western and Southwestern Sydney. So when you look at the demography of New South Wales, Western New South Wales, regional New South Wales looks a lot more like Western Sydney and southwestern Sydney than it looks like with uh, than it looks like the North Shore of Sydney or the eastern suburbs or the inner west or the Sutherland Shire, um, and that just goes to point this issue about this correlation between the performance of students and the SES of the communities that they that they live in. Um, as a former, well, I'm still a member of the National Party, but as a former National Party um, MP. I used to argue with my colleagues all the time that um, to remember that we actually have as electorates more in common with Labor Party electorates in Western Sydney than we do with Liberal Party electorates in the North Shore and the Eastern Suburbs. Not suggesting that the National Party go in coalition with, uh, with Labor. <laughs> <laughs> but I also want to show you this. So again, my apologies, it's a bit hard to see up the back, but when I was at the Gonski Institute, we again had Professor Holden do some work with us. So each of those dots represents a suburb, a, a postcode in New South Wales, regional and metropolitan. Every one of those dots, the size of the dots re reflects the population in that postcode. The uh, vertical um, axis is NAPLAN results. This is year three. So this is, what is it, 10, ten year olds. Year three, the, the vertical axis is NAPLAN results the horizontal axis is um, average household income. So basically, the further to the right you go here, the wealthier the family, the higher you go up, the better the performance. So you can see that low income, low performance, high income, high performance. Same, same chart, but in the orange are the, metropol are the, sorry, are the regional postcodes. 
So you can see that regional postcodes, the household income is lower, av average household income is lower, and the average performance is lower. This is the 10 largest regional centres. So you can see in the background is, is are the rest, but these are the 10 largest regional centres. Maitland, Wagga, Tweed Heads, Albury, Coffs Harbour, Port Macquarie, Nowra, Tamworth, Orange, Nowra. So again, you can see they're all in that kind of bottom quarter, quartile of that group of, uh, of communities. And for those who can see the squiggly line, just there, this is a really great graphic because if, if, I, if, you, if I could show you on the internet, it, it actually moves over a 10 year period. Again, the data is a little bit old, but it's not changed that much. Uh, but it, it, um, it moves progressively. You can, you can watch it in real time as, as it changes. But you'll see it just hasn't changed much. Average household income has gone up a bit, but the performance in education is not. It's pretty much stayed the same for all of those communities. This one's a little bit different. It's a little bit, it looks a little bit complicated, but it's not that complicated. What, what I've done here is, this is a narrow band. If you look at it like that, that's a, that's a narrow band of SES. So as I said, the performance of students is linked to their SES, their socioeconomic status. But that shows you that there is actually a big difference in, there can be a big difference in the performance of communities with similar SES. So they all have the similar, a similar SES. But you see some, some of those communities are doing really well, getting 480 compared to 380 um, in, in, their nap, in their average NAPLAN scores. So something's going on in, the, in some of those communities. Same, same SES, but a much higher performance. This one I just pulled out because it's, uh, it's the rural metro split again. This is the difference over uh, almost 10 year period. Um, these communities are St Ives and, St. Ives and Balmain. Uh, I, pulled out, I pulled out Griffith and Tamworth. I'm from Griffith, Tamworth is, a, is not far away. Um, but you'll see, even if you have a look at the economy, right, and they wonder why people in the country are unhappy about various things. <laughs> look at how much average household income increased in metropolitan electorates in 10 years compared to you know, two reasonably sized regional centres. Now, that is a massive jump in average household income compared to two big regional centres. And if you think about those, the 10 that we had before, it's not much different. When they say, why is there this big sort of regional metro divide, even politically, and you're seeing it in the United States too, this is part of it. Right? People in Sydney are getting richer much faster than, or getting you know, wealthier much faster than people who live in the regions. And that has then an education uh, impact as well. And then the, this, is, this is the last one um, of these. This is, um, this is Aladala, and that's Goulburn. So Aladala, for some reason, has a lower socioeconomic, on average, to say, just remember, always, this is always on average, lower socioeconomic than Goulburn, but it does a lot better. And you know, one of the questions that remains unanswered in education, in regional education, is why. Like, there's research there around, there should be research there around why is a school, why is a place like Ulladulla about the same size as Goulburn? Goulburn's two hours from Sydney, you can just about commute there, but the education performance is, is much lower. So there are lots of, uh, lots of really interesting questions um, um, to be, to be or issues to be resolved. Um, anyway. So an example of why one of the, an example of the challenges that rural and regions face is is, uh, is teachers finding teachers. Teachers have, as no, uh, no doubt, have a very big impact on the in-school performance. Oh, sorry, have a very big in-school impact on the performance of students. And I highlight in-school because when you hear about the performance of education in New South Wales or Australia. Immediately it goes to teachers aren't doing enough, teachers have got to do more, teachers have got to do things differently. Um, teachers do have, 
for obvious reasons, a huge impact on the way students perform at school. But how students perform in education is influenced by things, by, by schools, but um, some, some research would suggest it's influenced much more by what happens outside of school than what happens inside schools. So schools have some responsibility for the performance of our education system, but not the entire responsibility. But within school, teachers have uh, a very big um, impact. So maintaining a, a highly skilled workforce in the regions is difficult. Anyone who owns a business knows that too. It's not just in education, it's in healthcare, it's in aged care, it's in everything. Very difficult to uh, attract staff. Uh, attract, you know, attracting staff to a, a regional area usually involves moving a family as well, and there are the consequences of uh, employment for spouses, uh, etc. So there's lots of um, there's lots and lots of challenges around around staffing. Um, so outside of teachers, uh, what works? How do we how do we close the gap? Um, the key to really understanding uh, the gap is to understand the causal effects of any intervention you, you put in place. So we know teachers are important, we know facilities are important, we know the internet is important, but then it's what you do with that. So it's the training, that te how do you know whether the training that teachers are getting is actually having an impact on students? How do we know that any changes to the curriculum is having an impact on students? Uh, how do we know that any particular intervention, reading recovery or one of these other uh, interventions is, is having an impact? It's actually very hard to know because there's not enough research around what impacts um, those things are having. So we know in education, for example, that something that might work on one student, um, same, exactly the same thing doesn't have an impact on, on another student. We know through research that reading recovery that you, many people have heard of works really well if you've got a really good reading recovery teacher. Doesn't work if you don't have a good uh, reading recovery uh, teacher. Um, that causal impact to know that what you're doing is actually having an, an effect uh, on students is really important. Um, and, and an example that Richard gives in his research is he said, if, if we discovered that children of women who eat a lot of fish, when they're pregnant, tend to have higher university attendance, so that the, the children of women who eat fish when they're pregnant are more likely to go to university, would we conclude you don't have to think about whether you ate fish much when you... Would we conclude that fish consumption has an in utero educational benefit? Um, maybe, maybe. But we would also be worried that... Uh, Richard goes on. But we would also be worried that women who are wealthier tend to eat more fish than less wealthy women. And that is the trappings of wealth, uh, tutoring, um, schooling, other resources that contribute to the university attendance for the children, not the consumption of fish. So you've got to be really careful about actually what does, uh, what does have an impact, because we've seen lots of money get spent on things that look like they have an impact, providing, for example, providing a laptop to every student. Looks good, sounds good, makes for good photo, uh, photo opportunities for politicians, uh, but there's no evidence that they actually have uh, uh, any impact. So there's a lot of um, ideas out there about what, what works, but very little detailed research about the interventions that specifically work. But I want to share just a couple of interesting um, stories about incentives, because we, it's often talked about um, why don't you pay teachers bonuses, T pay teachers bonuses for their, their students' HSC results or their NAPLAN results or whatever it is. Um, uh, you know, why don't we pay students for their results? And they've done these experiments. They've done these experiments um, in the United States. Um, they, they, they do, they've done two types. There's a balanced, what's called a balanced incentive, where they paid money to students in the United States from six, year six, seven, and eight, uh, based on five measures. So kids got money if they satisfied these five measures. So attendance, behavior, short cycle assessments, so tests, and, and then there were two impacts that they, that they, that they could choose, uh, two impacts that related to the, ch the student's parents. So whether it was turning up to um, parent-teacher meetings or whatever it was. So there were five things, attendance, behavior, tests, and then two things that the parents did. They paid $2 million to 3,500 students uh, in the first year and 3.5 million to students in the second year. Um, 
across 17 schools. So, and they found 1% more likely to attend. Students were 1% more likely to attend. Not very much. 28% uh, fewer behavioural problems, right? And 13% more likely to report completing most or all of their homework. That is compared to 17 schools that they used to measure again. So they did it in 17 schools, but they were also looking at 17 schools where they weren't doing this. So they're looking at the difference in the performance of the kids in the 17 schools as opposed to the other 17 schools. So a big, a big difference. So, uh, and then on average, uh, the treatment parents attended almost twice as many parent-teacher uh, interviews, uh, conferences, and um, uh, then, then the other parents of, of the school that weren't part of the treatment. Uh, but most importantly, the, the PAGE students also had better test scores. Uh, the financial incentives increased reading test scores and math scores uh, significantly over the year, or the two years of the experiment. It led to a 17% increase in students scoring at or above the proficiency level for maths and 15% increase in reading per year. So, in conclusion, the incentives worked pretty well. But remember, they, they gave an incentive across five different things. Then they did an experiment where they actually only gave an incentive, they paid students for only one thing. And it seems like the obvious thing, pay, pay students to do maths. And that's, that's exactly what they did. They targeted the incentive. Um, yeah, so they, they, they t uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I've just skipped ahead a bit. So, um, yeah, so they paid, um, same thing, they took a, a group of students from a number of schools, paid them to do their maths, um, they, they got paid for the number of maths questions they attempted and then they got paid an additional amount if they got those maths um, questions right. Uh, and then they had a group of schools where they weren't doing any interventions, but they were still monitoring the, the, the performance of their maths um, the, or the rest of their academic performance in the other schools as well. What they found, uh, perhaps surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, is that their maths results increased by about 15% but their reading and English scores declined by about the same amount. Now, it's not surprising, right? You do what you get paid to do. Because they're only paying for one thing, kids went beauty. So if you have the cho choice between doing maths homework and your English homework, of course you're going to choose your maths homework. So they, they get virtually no net effect for whatever incentive they were, so whatever incentive they were paying for. Okay, and I just tell you that because it's, it's interesting because you know a lot of the proposed answers to solving this gap problem can be very superficial. I work in a in a in a for a consulting firm where they pay bonuses to um, people, and they lots of organisations pay bonuses. And I keep saying to them, I think bonuses are a dumb idea because it it gives you an incentive to do one thing. It doesn't actually give you an incentive necessarily to do the right thing by the organisation you even work for. Whatever your KPI is, that's what you're going to focus, not all of your attention, but much of your attention. And they find the same thing uh, in, in education. And in fact, they, they, they did, uh, not Richard, but um, others have done, um, the, the education systems in the US have tried this where they've paid teachers incentives based on the performance of their students. Uh, and actually what they found was that um, they cheated. They cheated in order to meet the KPIs. Because obviously, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're on an improvement pathway, the first part of the improvements really is quite easy, and then it gets harder and harder the, the, the higher you perform. So often the only way you can get the same amount of growth is to start cheating. Give your kids, give your students the answers to the tests, change the results, you know. They started to change even the parameters of what success looked like. So in the end, they ended up spending a lot of money uh, for no particular purpose. So, Having said all of that, uh, what does the gap cost the Australian economy? So, I'm just going to have to bear with me here for a second because uh, Richard and the economists love, love mathematics, but I won't, I'm not going to go into the mathematics. Um, the ideal way to measure um, the economic impact of improved performance or narrowing that gap um, is to uh, look at the... Imp um, Sorry, 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 sorry. What have I done here? I've, 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 I've mixed, missed. Oh, sorry. Without, yeah. Again, without boring with the mathematics, um, the gap between 
rural and metropolitan students based on the earning capacity or the lost earning capacity because of that gap um, uh, or the difference, what they call the difference in human capital formation uh, and skill development is 18.3%. Uh, so that 18.3% that uh, performance gap because of the education gap uh, cost the Australian economy 3.3% uh, of GDP or $55 billion. Now, doesn't mean you have to, that's a, that's a big number and what we should aim for is not necessarily, well we should aim of course for closing that gap entirely, but even if you closed half that gap, you close that, half that gap, you make a $27 billion impact on the Australian economy. And you know, when, the higher the money, the amount of money you talk about, the less relevant it becomes. What is $55 billion? What does that buy you? How big is the entire Australian economy? You know, to put it into some kind of perspective. To put it in that perspective, $55 billion is larger than the contribution of the, Australia, the entire Australian tourism industry. So to get that equivalent effect, you would need to double the entire Australian tourism industry, or you would have to quadruple the size of the Australian beef industry to, say, to, to achieve the same economic uh, improvement. And that $55 billion is only the difference in the salary you get when you've got a higher level of attainment. So an apprentice is going to earn or somebody who's done an apprenticeship is going to earn more than a student who left year 10 and has not gone on to do further study, on average. Um, somebody with a, a, a bachelor's degree will earn more, on average, than somebody who's done a certificate four at TAFE. Somebody who's got a PhD, on average, will earn, earn higher. And what The Economist just looked at is the difference in the earning capability based on those different levels of, of, uh, of educational achievement. But they didn't, they didn't even look at what difference does it make in terms of um, any of the other sort of social consequences? So if you've got skills, you're, more, you're less likely to be um, dependent on um, welfare. You're, more, you're, you're much less likely to be in the criminal justice system. You're lots of other social consequences uh, of a more highly uh, educated uh, population. Now, it's not to say people with lots of qualifications don't commit crimes because Plenty of them do, uh, as, as you know, and are well publicised, although they do tend to get away with it a lot more than, uh, than others. Um, you know, if you steal $100 million from a bank, it's fraud, but if you go across the road to the service station and don't pay for petrol, it's, it's theft, right? I, I reckon they've got that, that's uh, something... Anyway. Um, so why does all this matter? For me, it matters, as, particularly as a former politician. I'm going to end on this note. As, particularly as a, as a former politician, uh, as a former education minister, we're always arguing about investing money. So all ministers are in there in government arguing with Treasury about investing more money in their portfolio. So whether it's in health or roads or rail, whatever it was, education, we're all in there arguing for more money. And Treasury and the finance people have a lot of influence about where money goes. And economics has a big, has a big influence on that. So, you know, a lot of the debate even within local government, I was talking to some of the people in the main street, about um, there's too much emphasis on infrastructure, inland rail. I mean, if we had debated over the last 20 years the gap in education performance in the regions, as much as we've debated, debated inland rail, I reckon we would have gone halfway to solving the problem. But, you know, economics, job creation, the immediacy, sometimes the short-term thinking of, of governments and pol politics, leads us to, to provide more emphasis on the more visible investments that governments make. Bridges, roads, buildings. You know, we spend lots of money on buildings, hospitals and schools. You've got to have high quality healthcare services. You've got to have high quality education services inside those buildings. So you know, it's one thing to argue the social benefit of, a, of high quality education. That's one thing. But there is a very significant economic impact. So when we talk about should we invest billions into inland rail or should we invest billions into education, they're the equal arguments because if you improve education, you're going to have an equal, if not greater, impact on the economy than inland rail. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that we don't build, build inland rail or that we don't build new roads and, you know, and then bushfires happen and floods happen, you've got to fix all of that. 
not about actually one against the other. It's actually understanding the economic impacts of, uh, of education, and particularly in the regions of, of, of filling that gap. Kids leave town to go and further their, their studies. Kids leave town because they want to get jobs where they've got the qualifications, so they go and do whatever they do at a, uh, a vet certificate or they go to university. And in, and in regional communities, sometimes there's not the jobs um, for them. But a lot of businesses don't set up here or they set up and move, again, because they can't find the skill staff that they need. The rice industries, um, Sunrise used to have their head office in Leeton, but they couldn't get accountants, marketing people, um, uh, currency traders, etc., in Leeton, so they've moved to the CBD of Sydney. Um, these are the social and economic consequences uh, of, of having this gap in, um, in education performance uh, in Australia. I mean, it matters, it matters a lot to individuals, but it, it means a lot to communities as well. And um, what I've tried to argue over the last 10 years, uh, including today, is that, that, is that investment in education, not just money, but even just put, putting people's policy thinking minds to it, giving it the actual um, intellectual attention that it needs to come up with some of these solutions to make sure that every student gets a great education in regional New South Wales, at least equal to what their metropolitan uh, uh, um, equivalents are getting, uh, is important to their individual lives, but so important to the economies uh, of regional Australia. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Professor Pigley. I'd like to, um, as uh, most of these speeches do, they raise many questions, and uh, of course, we always end up uh, with a question and answer. Have you been warned of this? Yeah, I have. Oh, oh, good. <laughs> uh, question and answer session. So, I have um, a roving mic, uh, so uh, I'd like to welcome uh, to um, moderate this, this session. I'd like to welcome uh, Diane Barnes. Uh, to come forward. Diane is, a, Diane is educator, advisor and board member of the Henry Parks Foundation. Now we have a Roby mic and a mic for Diane and uh, so if you can raise your hand if you have a question I'll come to you with the radio mic and uh, please wait for the mic and use the mic because as we've said before the session is being recorded so we'd like to pick up everything that we can. Thank you. back to the beginning. Please welcome Diane. Firstly, it does unravel a whole ball of strength, does it not? <laughs> Firstly, I'd like to thank you for personalising it. Putting a photo of your children up reminded us all of what education is about. Whether we have children or not, we know children, we were once a child, and we have invested in education as anyone else in the world. Australia is leading the pack, despite what peers and the media might tell us. One of the things I'd like to focus on in asking you is if you have a look at the media impact when peers and results come out, Australia is often denigrated. And we go into the teach bashing, we go into why aren't we performing, what is happening or not happening. How much is the media responsible for detrimental impact on the psychological well-being of teaching and on students who hear that you're not doing good enough, the competition versus achievement level? Hi. So PISA is the international, um, I, can't, I can't remember exactly what it stands for, but because I'll get it wrong. So it's one of the international tests. They do a few. Um, so, it, most of the OECD countries do it, and it's a way of kind of ranking countries, unfortunately. In Australia, when students do it, they randomly select schools and students. So you, you, never, you never had to do any of these national tests, international tests, did you? I mean, they, they do NAPLAN, they got, these, these students were done, the, the captains have done NAPLAN. But anyway, they do this, they randomly select schools and they randomly select students. In Australia, I don't think students who do it, from what I hear, don't take it particularly seriously. It doesn't add to your, um, it doesn't add to your, you know, it doesn't count to anything, it doesn't count to your report. In other countries of the world, um, in Singapore, for example, I've heard this story, and you know, whether it's true or not, 
but when they do it, the the whole school gathers outside the hall and they cheer the kids in as they go into the hall about you know this is for Singapore. And then I heard this other great story that in that in Iceland, <laughs> they used to pay the kids. They used to give kids pizza and. Um, pizza and coke after the test, so the kids were like really motivated. And then when the GFC ha happened, Iceland went broke and they had to cut out the, 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 the pizza and the coke and their pizza results went way down. So, you know, I would question, and a lot of people question the accuracy of pizza and Tim's and these various other things that they do. But even if they're, but even if they're true, I think the unfortunate thing that the debate around all of those results, even when NAPLAN results come out, is that it it, um, it it incorrectly defines what the, tries to define what the the problem is, and this is when they they start to start to say teachers need to do this, teachers need to do that, and it does have an impact on the morale of teachers because every state in the country in New South in Australia, every jurisdiction, government schools, Catholic schools, independent schools, the statistics are all in line. So it's not that New South Wales is doing something wrong and Victoria is doing something right. All the trends are the same, um, whether that's going up or, or going down. In fact, a, a lot of these results would suggest that it's actually high-performing students in high school that where the, where the results are coming down, why, we, why we're in some of these tests seem to be declining internationally. Um, so, you know, some of the big independent schools um, in, in, in capital cities are actually responsible for some of that, must be, must be responsible for some of that decline because a lot of high-performing kids go to those inter independent schools or the selective schools in Sydney. But that's not what you hear in the media. It's oh. teachers got to do more, teachers got to do something wrong with schools. And it also takes some of the responsibility off parents too. As I said, what, how students perform is so much influenced by what happens to them outside of school. They're only in school from 9 till 3.30, 40 weeks of the year, the rest of the time they're at home. And as I said, the, the trends are national. So to me, there are cultural trends in Australia that are causing some of these. Now, is it mobile phones? I don't know. Is it, you know, people are busier because of cost of living, so more parents are working, longer hours, or what? But, you know, it, it actually, unfortunately, I think, hides much of the important part of the debate and is easy to say, schools are, schools are doing something wrong. And, you know, even points to that argument, you just need to invest more money. Now, I think you do need to invest more money, but a lot more, there needs to be a lot more thinking about it. So I don't think it has a great impact. I that. And I think most of us would know that education is the best long-term investment you can ever make. <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience before I keep talking and asking more questions? We'll come back to you, Murray. <laughs> Hi Adrian, um, my name is Stephanie. I'm really invested in everything you said. I'm the principal at the, at the high school. Um, one of the things I took away from what you said was just how important it is economically to invest in regional edu education and closing that gap. And you emphasise that it doesn't just have to be money, but it's ideas. Um, what do you think, if there's just one or two things, what do you think is the most important <coughs> Well, that is the that is the million dollar yeah, question. I, you know, I, look, and it's having for a school to operate. So I, I think for schools to operate, and you yourself as a principal, um, for you to operate your school at one hundred percent is the only thing you can do as a school is just be operating at one hundred percent. Now, what stops you from doing that? Sometimes it's the service you get from, in your case, the department. Um, do I have the staff I need, the numbers and the skills of the staff I need? Do I have an IT system that works properly? Do I have um, you know, assets? Do I have uh, resources, um, you know, just, uh, curriculum resources uh, and the like? Do I have good curriculum? Do I have good assessment tools? Do my teachers get the right professional development? There's a lot of research that says, if you let teachers do whatever professional development they choose, it's not very effective. If it's targeted professional development, it's actually much more effective. So, you know, I, I'm certainly of the philosophy that you give teachers what they need, and this is what I tried to do when I was minister, give schools and teachers what they need, and then you let them do their thing. You know, there's accountabilities and whatever, but you don't intervene and try and tell them 
I mean, I would never tell it. I'm not a teacher. I would never tell a teacher at school what to do. So to be able to get those those services to you as a school allows you to operate at 100%. Is all you, is all you can do within the school. I actually think the 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 outside of school. Um, you know, how much can you influence about what happens outside of schools? Um, is really where the magic will happen in, in education. Because that correlation between socioeconomic and school student performance is, is really important. You know, just getting to put through parents' heads that, you know, make sure your kids have a good night's sleep before they come to school. Parents have got to teach their children about discipline and about taking responsibility. So much of that now is put onto schools. Um, you know, there was, a, there was an example given to me where a parent turned up at the front of the school with, and the kid wouldn't get out of the car, so they went and got a teacher to get the kid out of the car. Like, that's not really a teacher's responsibility, and that's why a lot of teachers get driven out of the profession, right? Because they're taking on the responsibilities of parents. Now, parents, parents generally don't like to hear that. that. But, you know, we've just kind of got to get this thing culturally in our head about, about the importance of what we do outside of schools. Yes, the school's got to operate at 100%, and, and government departments or the Catholic system or whoever it is got to be held accountable to, to deliver that. Um, schools are often actually made accountable to the department as opposed to the department being accountable to schools. Um, you know, that's where really the, the, the difference um, is going to be made around how you get, the, how your students get the, su the support from, from outside the school in their community and, and at home. Adrian, I wonder if I could piggyback on that Stephanie's question. Uh, New South Wales has a rural and remote education strategy 2021 to 2024, a very short window of time for a strategy to be implemented. They identify student uh, staffing, recruitment, retention and PL, together with curriculum choices, IT being the third one and the final one, partnerships. From a statistician viewpoint, <laughs> and an economist. Do you feel that's a too short a period of a strategy to be implemented? Oh, that, look, it's a 20 year, it's a, an education's gotta be looked at, everything has gotta, it's gotta be like a rolling 20 years. It's not 20 years either start now and finish in 20 years. It's gotta be a 20 year moving, moving strategy in education. What used to frustrate me, so I was deeply involved in the whole Gonski school funding um, debate and, People would say, well, we've, we've after, after it had started to be implemented, certainly in New South Wales, after a couple of years, some media outlets would say, oh, look, it's been going for a couple of years and NAPLAN results haven't improved. And I said, well, they've been building the Northwest Rail Link um, in Sydney. They've spent $3 billion out of the $8 billion they're going to spend. They've spent $3 billion building it. Not a single passenger has travelled on it. So is it a failure? You know, everything takes a bit of time, but in, in infrastructure, they don't ask that question. But in education, they, they do. People want immediate results. I mean, if you brought, if you introduce some magical intervention in education, it's probably not going to affect, or it's not going to improve the performance of a student in year 12 or year 11, because they've had 14 years or 12 years of school beforehand. When the, when the kids starting to get that intervention at kindergarten, year one, year two, by the time they get to year 12, it may have started to make an impact. You know, targeting literacy and numeracy at year 10 is almost, not pointless, but it's not like targeting it in kindergarten year one, even pre-going pre to school. We have a question here from Murray. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian, for your oration. And I, I work as a developmental paediatrician in Newcastle, so I get to see children you know, in their school years and hear about their educational outcomes and in fact what you just mentioned there segues nicely into my question which really is about where should the investment happen and I think there's quite a lot of evidence that educational outcomes are already predetermined before children arrive at school mm -hmm. and I think your focus on the socio-economic status of the children and their families is critical but my question really is <clears throat> Given that I don't think government policy is going to change people's socio-economic status, I wondered whether there, you know, whether we're going to invest more in universal early childhood education because I think that's really where people, you know, we're getting a bang for our buck 
Yeah. But look, that, that's right. I don't think governments in Australia have been started to move towards that. So making early childhood um, free and accessible. So one, one thing is about making it free, uh, certainly affordable. And the other thing is making it accessible um, at least two days a week. Um, but and governments have started to move towards that. The federal government and the New South Wales government have said that's one of their strategies over the next five years. Yeah, because before you go to school, and I can't remember the stats off the top of my head, but um, a, a child born into a high socioeconomic family will have heard four million words by the time they're five. Uh, in low, lower socioeconomic, it'd be like 400,000 words. So the difference of, for that student in a cognitive and you know developmental sense is makes a big difference not just the words but the complexity of language the interaction with parents and other um, peers uh, is significant so that kid with four million words turning up to kindergarten as opposed to the kid who's never held a pen or can't have never read a book i mean their trajectories are already set before they start it's only the intervention of incredible teachers that can actually bridge that gap but you know, you are fighting, you're fighting a, not a losing battle, but you're fighting a battle right from the first day I start school. We have another question to the lectern. Thank you, Professor. It's been a fascinating talk. Um, back in the day, IQ tests were important for some of us last century, um, <laughs> apparently. Um, since then, of course, we've realised that there are different sorts of intelligences and talents and attributes and so on. Um, I'm wondering, with careers advisors, that appreciation of a, of a child's unique interests and capabilities, is that being overlooked these days? Because my sense back then was that you could identify for a lot of us kids what our interests were and yep. there was streaming in, in the school education. Has that been overlooked? Is it not PC anymore? I, th I think schools do everything they can to identify the individuality of, of students and to cater for that. I mean, they're different now, they're different learning styles, some are visual, some are, I don't know, the teachers in the room would be better at explaining the different teachers are. But I think schools are really try to, try to identify that and, and play to students' strengths. Um, streaming still happens, uh, but I think the best evidence now is it probably shouldn't happen in primary school. Now, I'm going to get this wrong, so if, if I'm wrong, please put your hand up and say, Adrian, that's not quite right. I won't be offended at all. But I think streaming in primary school is not so much a thing now because children develop at different, sp at different paces. So if you stream a kid and say, you're really good at maths when they're in year three, or you're not really good at maths, they start to believe it yet they might develop at a, different, at a different pace. So I think that schools are careful about streaming. They, they do it in up, uh, what, year, year, seven, year eight maybe? Year eight, year seven and year eight. So yeah, I think they do really try to identify the unique uh, capabilities of students and, and, and cater to them. But it's all about teachers having the time to do that because it is time consuming. Um, you know, back in the day, there was one teaching style and whether you fit in or not, it didn't matter, that was the teaching style. There's that, there's that saying that, you know, you used to graduate from school. Adrian, I wonder if I could extend that to yeah. New South Wales, specifically to Sydney and the difference between, uh, you know, a city and a rural setting, in that the selective high schools and opportunity classes in New South Wales have been part of the institution of education here for many decades. Um, and they are screened at year three, the opportunity, well, yep, year yep. five and six yep. for the opportunity classes, yep. and then from seven on yep. in selective high schools. That is a big gap between opportunities for children in regional locations versus city. Yeah, no, and, and one of the things in that education strategy and the one before that, there was a, an education strategy before that, was about providing more of that extension those extension opportunities for students in the regions. I mean, I'm not a great fan of selective schools anyway. I, I think they, I mean, they were, the reason selective schools started was because the public education system was losing a lot of students to independent schools. So they set up selective schools to try and um, stop that drain out of, out, of, uh, out of public schools. But, you know, we've got 45 of them in New South Wales. Victoria's got five. I don't think the New South Wales 
education system performs any better than Victoria, even with all of those um, selected schools. I don't know that any, I don't think there's any fully selected schools in the regions. I think there are some partly selected schools. But then schools do try and provide extension programs for, for students, both in high school and in primary school. And one of the things that has been developed in New South Wales is the Aurora College, which is a, which is a virtual selective school. And it does um, it does quite well. I don't know. Have any of your students at Tenerfield do it? Doing it? Yes. Yeah, we have Aurora College. And is it going all right? Yeah, yeah. We're here 11 to 12 students in particular. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it does two things. The subjects that you can't do, you might not be able to do because there's not enough students, but also for really high performing students. As I said, there's just that caution about it's maybe it's it's for some students who are obviously really gifted, but when you stream every kid. And telling a kid they're really smart doesn't affect them negatively, but telling a kid they're not smart definitely affects them negatively. So that's why I think there's that reluctance to stream kids, to stream all kids or to rank all kids and say, look, you're really clever, you're not, because then you just start to believe it. Do we have more questions from the floor? Up the back there, thank you. Adrian, um, Peter Penny and I was very late getting here. Jeremy Parks, obviously, with the, with the uh, uh, time change between Queensland and New South Wales. <laughs> right. But I do come from Queensland, but I just had the time to bugger. <laughs> Not putting it on the spot, but in your time as Minister of Education with, that, with the uh, Conservative Government, what are you proud of? Uh, you mean in education or just generally? Just generally, in your, in your time as Minister for Education, yeah, yeah. What, what are you proud of? What were you achieving? So I'm not putting you on the spot. No. Because <laughs> I, I, I'm sort of like a local government, but I always yep. say to the councillors for every four year yep. term, yep. you can't look back on that four years and you've, you've, you've achieved something. Yep. Tell me what you've yep. achieved. If you just yep. sat in a room and bigger than argued with each other, yep. you've achieved nothing. So what, what do you feel that you've achieved? Yeah. You know what, I reckon we, uh, the best overall achievement of the government yep. was that we got the budget sorted, organised, um, to the point where we had surpluses to spend. And I think we've transformed infrastructure in New South Wales over 12 years. So most regional places, most, most country communities, you've seen, and I, and I don't know Tenterfield exactly, but I know in Griffith where I live, and it was one of the safest seats, so this whole thing about pork barrelling and marginal seats, etc. If I had to go, if I was an MP now, I'd have trouble to say, you know, when, when, my, when the leader of the party said, tell us what you need in Griffith, I'd have trouble saying, because we've got a brand new 50 metre pool. It's got a new brand new $10 million stadium. It's got a brand new, you know, school's about a stack of money spent. It's partway through building a $100 million hospital. Like, we made very difficult decisions around public sector wages and various other things in order to have that money to invest in, in infrastructure and the expansion of, of services. So, you know, freeways, bridges, all those kinds of things we just talked about. But also to have the money to, and because the second thing I was gonna say, the thing I'm proud of in education, yes was actually being able to invest money into the Gonski funding reforms. So what used to happen was that every school kind of got an allocation of money and it was a bit of a funny formula and you know you'd have one school um, you'd have one school that was getting you know eight thousand dollars per student a school across the road exactly the same was getting twelve thousand dollars. There was no particular reason it might have been a historical reason why the funding was different. The, the, what Gonski really did was said, look, now we look at every single student, every single student gets the same base amount, but then if, if, you, if you as a student have one of those disadvantages, low SES, rural and remote, Aboriginal, non-English speaking, you get, for each student they get an additional amount. So, um, so if there are two schools exactly the same and one of them's in Tenerfield and one of them's in Griffith, no, same number of students, the same demographics, the schools get exactly the same amount of money. So that was, the, that was the change to the, ref, the, the funding formula, but we also, because we were good managers of the budget, we actually had the money to invest, additional money to invest in it, and we got out of the Commonwealth $2 for every dollar we put in. Yeah. And I think that's made a big difference. I, you know, hopefully Tenderfield's getting, had got, got you know, extra money. And, but you know, what, what, I, what I actually saw when I was the minister and they briefed me about what impact, which, which schools would get the most extra money out of the Gonski funding reforms. They showed me rural and remote got the most, regional got the second, Western Sydney got the third, 
and North, the North Shore and the Eastern Suburbs got the least. And I just went, well, that's, we're going to go down this path. Can I commend you on that? Having been in schools at that time, it worked. <laughs> and just to, to just then amplify that again, the kind of diversity we're looking at in New South Wales schools, 43.5% of our schools are in rural regions, mm -hmm. and it's 565 in a city. Mm -hmm. So when you look at that diversity in terms of the scale, the dimension, the geography, the diversity of our population, the multicultural ethnicity, the number of languages spoken in our schools, the distance travelled for everyone involved to get to remote and regional areas, it's really complex. Yeah. So I really commend you for not saying a one size fits all to the budgeting and to actually differentiate according to an SES social economic status need because I think it did start to move the, the temperature gauge. Hopefully. So I thank you for that on a personal <laughs> level. Any more questions from the audience? Sorry, um, it's Lydia Brown. Uh, I am thinking of the um, ICPA schools mm -hmm. and the funding for them. Mm -hmm. Like we talk about the independent schools and the public schools. What about the ICPA schools? Um, do they get the same funding that the other children get from the other schools? There's, uh, I'm a Queenslander and we have a lot of uh, uh, remote students. Yep. that all learn from home yep. and they have a, like a school in, say, in Longridge or Winton, some of the outlying work where they contact the students over Zoom or yep. internet yep. and it's the parents that teach the schools, yep. the, the students. So I just wonder how uh, having a parent, parent's tuition with that child, if that child is um, um, benefits more yeah. than maybe in a public school. No, so, so the students who, who were at the, well, one of the ICPA, were ICPA students or ICPA schools certainly received more funding. funding. ICPA, I've got to say, for a relatively small group of people, were in my office all the bloody time. Uh. They got the, I've got to say, they're the best lobbyists. Because I think also because the president was from... Um, not uh, West Wylam, she was oh, one, oh. for this for a few years ago, it was from West Wylam, which is in my electorate, so I, I couldn't say no every time she rang, I said, can I have a minute, but um, yeah. But one of the funny things we did do is the, um, the show, uh, you know, the show, um, what, do you, what, do you, what do you call the show people that, you know, the people that travel around for the country shows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have got to be the most well-connected group of people. So when I was minister, I... Somebody from my office said, oh, the Showman's Guild or whatever, I want to talk to you about um, the funding, because they used to get funding from the Queensland government and they gave them a truck and they travel around and blah, but the Queensland government had cut their funding and now they wanted to see if they could get some funding out of New South Wales. And I kind of went, oh yeah, look, okay, okay, okay. Then I get a phone call from Bill Shorten, who at the time was the minister for something or other in the Gillard government asking me about the Showman's Guild. And I'm thinking, oh, gee, we're, you know, federal minister's ringing me up about the show, the show kids. And then um, another bloke, a Labor senator, rang me up and said, the Showman's Guild, <laughs> these people are really, really well connected. Anyway, we did sort them out. And now every time I go to the show at Foster every year with my family, um, one of the, 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 the woman who runs the pink, I think it's called the pink family show thing. Every time she sees me, even 10 years later, she comes up and gives me a big hug and says, thanks for what you did for the kids. So one of her kids was there and now her kid's off doing something amazing. Yeah. Do we have time for one Sorry, more question? Sorry, that was my sidetrack. Thank you. Adrian, I have a, I have a question. I have two, uh, two children who are both teachers, both in the high school system. Uh, one in the public system and one in the government system. Uh, they work very hard um, and by the end of term they come, they're absolutely exhausted. My concern is, and I know how difficult it is um, to bring attracting people into education, similarly with nursing. My concern is that 
with all this money that's spent on education, there doesn't appear to be enough going into support for the actual educators. Do you see that as an issue? Because when I talk to my, both my children, who are totally different ends of the spectrum, coming home completely exhausted because of all the extracurriculum they have to do, particularly my daughter, who works with a lot of difficult children, they don't get enough support. They're working, you know, we we're, were up positioning the other day, and she was working nights till eight, nine o'clock at night at school, you know, attending to, to parents, attending presentation nights, and all this sort of stuff. Things that should be nice to do, but they're, they're added on all the time. Now these guys, and I'm, and I'm pretty sure it applies to our local teachers, are working extremely hard to educate these children, but there does not seem to be enough support coming in yeah. for those for those educators. Yeah. yeah. So there are there are there's a couple of things here. There are more teachers now, more staff in schools, more money, you know, as, as over the last ten years. But I think probably some part of the problem and, and principal would be better better able to answer this question. But Parental expectations have changed, and then the expectations of, of systems, in this case the public system or the Catholic system or whatever, whatever it is, the board if it's an independent school, have also increased. So, And a lot of that's been driven by some of this, what we talked about in the first question, which is this public debate, this public narrative about schools. Schools got to do more, they've got to be more accountable, you know, NAPLAN scores, it's all about, it's all about NAPLAN scores, so schools have got to constantly do assessment, they've got to constantly report. Which, which means teachers have to do that. So teachers have always gone to school presentations and they've done sport. It's actually all the other things. There's other things that they're doing now that they didn't previously have to do. It's not fewer teachers, except if there are vacancies in schools. But you know, I'm sure the, the, the principal who's here with us today probably spends half her, half her day ringing around trying to find casuals. Um, that's something that probably took much less time uh, 10 years ago. So it's all these other administrative things that are, that are taking teachers away from the things that they really like doing. I often argue, but again, this, I think this is a cultural thing amongst um, schools and teachers, that teachers often do things that are, often have to do things that are not teacher kind of roles, responsibilities. Do a lot of admin that could have been done by somebody else. Um, there's no reason why, for here, for example, at Tenderfield High School, why you couldn't have an admin person employed to support three head teachers. But it's hard for schools to get their head around employing more admin people. And no, I, don't, I don't mean just schools, but even the system, it's hard to get their head around we're going to spend money on an admin person. I have a good friend who's a head English teacher, and he said he spent he was spending so much time photocopying HSC stuff, I can't remember exactly what he was photocopying. But why is one of the highest paid people at that school photocopying stuff, spending hours and hours photocopying stuff? I mean, that's not how you should run any organisation. The highest value people, the highest cost people, value people, do the highest value work. The lower, the lower value people, you, you employ people at a lower cost to do. Now that's not easily, you know, sometimes you just gotta do stuff. But you know, the principal I saw on TV said, oh, you know, I had to kick my high heels off the other day and go and clean the toilet, clear the toilet, because it was blocked. I thought, why is the principal doing that? Like, and, and probably because she knew that if she asked somebody in the office to do it, they probably would have said no. And again, that's a cultural problem within education too. There's this, it's a very flat kind of, there is a hierarchy, but you know, it can be a bit touchy sometimes asking teachers to do things that are not their responsibility. So ultimately, the ultimate responsibility is the principal. So it's the principal that kicks off their shoes and has to go and unblock the toilet. So I think this is a bigger problem about teachers being asked to do a lot more things. Parent expectations are coming in and, you know, why is, my, why is my kid on detention? Because they're a pain in the neck at school, because their behaviour is out of control. And then there's expectation, expectation that the, t the school's responsible for that when they're not, you know? Adrian, I think we started the Q&A with a statement that said, the complexity of education is like unravelling. 
<laughs> it truly is a complex and a differentiated dialogue that we need to have many of. I thank you for that. I'm going to now call on someone to give the formal thanks. And on behalf of the audience, I'd like to express my thanks for the candor and the humour with which you delivered a lot of economic and, <laughs> Sorry, a bit and, and regional contrast between rural and city. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Professor Pickley and Diane, and uh, a good session. I'd now like to call upon the Chair of the Parks Foundation, Mr Ian Tom, and the Chair of the Friends of the School of Arts, Mr Peter Jeffrey, to come forward uh, to move a vote to thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Harry. Wow. Man, you've got passion. You love education. And uh, we're really grateful for that. And he deserves a second round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> a lot of things got covered there, but a couple of points that, that I really wanted to bring out. The mother. Henry left school at eight. His mother wasn't well educated, but she had learnt and heard stories she could remember off by heart, and she would teach Henry those stories as a young boy. And that set him on the way to gaining a further education, which he got at a school of arts when he was about 16. So there's a big gap there, and you know, you imagine what it was like leaving school at eight, where you would be now. So it's been a big struggle for a man that could do that and still become Premier of this state. The other thing I thought was quite important was the investment in education and what it does was very similar to what Henry did with the railway in trying to force those railways out to the states or out within the state, you know, out the regional areas. Every time the train stopped at a station, a community built, a community generated money, the economy flew, boomed. And all that had this compounding interest effect on, on the way things were done. Now, some of Henry's uh, famous quotes uh, have lived on long after his death. And, and I think perhaps the most famous one he was really known of is the one people, one destiny one. But there's another one which he says, in one hand I have a dream, in the other I have an obstacle. Tell me which one grabs your attention. Well, today you've shown us the dream of improved regional education, the benefits it can provide for the whole country. And if we can get over that obstacle and getting the decision makers to understand the longer term benefits that are possible rather than just the time frame between elections. So telling us what can and needs to be done, you, what you've done there, certainly has grabbed our attention. You can see that by the participation. Now, finding a gift suitable for this erasion has been challenging. However, I do have here for you a bottle of schoolhouse headmaster cab set. <laughs> it was very hard to find a bottle with a school reference. Uh, and um, I thought that that was pretty good. But uh, another one I do have too is, is a bottle of partnership because it has been a partnership with you and we appreciate you doing that for us. At the bottom of each of these little bags, there are a couple of little other tokens to help you remember Henry. Uh, one is a 1996 silver proof dollar which has done 100 years of his death and a 2015 medallion for 200 years uh, when he was born. Um, also, you now joined the ranks of the predecessors who we've got up here. We published this for the 200 years of Henry's uh, death in 2015, birth in 2015, sorry. And this, this has got the, the first bundle of our orators, the crimson thread. Uh, Henry's phrase, the crimson thread of kinship runs through us all. 
So, uh, just have to thank you so much again for the personal effort, what you put in, you brought the family into this thing, you've tied it all together for us and it's had so much meaning. Thank you so much. This is a joint effort, and I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed here. I particularly like to thank Adrian for, for coming and, and tackling a very, very difficult subject. Um, there's never, there never will be one right answer or one wrong answer. You just got to keep, keep at it. The, the, the friends of the School of Arts are particularly happy to have it in this room. Uh, as I said earlier, it's great to have life back in the, in the centre again. And uh, we, we, the friends of the School of Arts haven't been buying bottles of wine or anything, but we, we do have a medallion to, to uh, um, represent your, your day here today. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Peter. If I may, just before Peter goes. Yes. Peter, on behalf of the Foundation, it has been a partnership, and we thank you, and as a representative of the Friends, we turned up here the other day, or yesterday, the Friends said, we want help to put out all the chairs. 35 people turned up to help. Now that is an asset the Council has not acknowledged. It's a brilliant asset for this village, town, sorry. Go, mate. Enjoy. Do I have to imbibe on behalf of everybody? No, no, I'm not <laughs> I was going to say, Peter, I don't know how you're going to divide that between 35, <laughs> but anyway, we'll work it out somehow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude our 2000 and, uh, we're on 2023 Parks Oration. We thank you all very much for coming along today. It's been a wonderful occasion. It's been wonderful to see you all back in this building. Uh, we will conclude, we'll retire now to the courtroom, uh, sorry, courtyard. <laughs> we'll keep the courtroom for later on. We'll retire to the courtyard uh, for afternoon tea. Thank you all very much for your attendance.